Hi, my name is Naomi Haas, and I am a professor of medicine at the Abramson Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and I'm an expert in kidney cancer and prostate cancer. So our study was basically a real world uh, evaluation of uh, what we were seeing uh, based on SEER Medicare data as far as the population of patients with kidney cancer based on stage and their uh, risk of uh, recurrence uh, if they had a primary tumor resected. And what we found was that the results in the real world really did parallel the patient population that was studied in Keynote 564, which was adjuvant pembrolizumab for one year versus uh, uh, placebo. So my recommendations for surveillance and for follow-up are, are really quite parallel to what we are currently recommending in the NCCN guidelines. And the NCCN guidelines recently approved, uh, listed uh, pembrolizumab as a option for patients with uh, PT2 high grade and PT3 and higher kidney cancer as an option for patients to consider for treatment. We would consider, we would continue our uh, recommended surveillance of these patients for high risk disease, which is doing performing imaging at a minimum of every six months uh, for the first three years after nephrectomy and then on a yearly basis until year five uh, for most patients, as well as a physical exam and, and blood work. So there are a number of adjuvant trial proposals being uh, thought about in this space. Um, what we really need is are better biomarkers to understand several things. One is the intensity of treatment. Are we over-treating some patients and under-treating other patients? For example, the PT2 high-grade uh, kidney cancer. In our study, we only had 10 uh, patients that fell into this category, so it's very hard to comment on that category of patients, uh, but we, uh, you know, there are patients with PT2 and PT3 cancer that never recur. And so to give those patients adjuvant therapy is probably over-treating those patients. On the converse, patients who have a metastatectomy within a year of uh, nephrectomy, which is the what we call the M1 population, the standard of care if you consider metastatic disease is generally dual either immune checkpoint and CTLA-4 therapy or treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy and a VEGF inhibitor. And so to give them just single agent monotherapy are we under-treating that population? And there are a number of biomarkers that are uh, currently being evaluated kind of in a retrospective space. And these are things such as DNA methylation, circulating tumor DNA, uh, KIM-1, which is a renal injury uh, protein that's being looked at, as well as um, looking at the tissue, and there are a number of uh, uh, transcript, transcriptomic patterns which might indicate whether patients respond better to immune checkpoint therapy or to a VEGF inhibitor therapy. And so these are being evaluated retrospectively in, in a number of adjuvant trials. And if we 
could see a signal in these, I would propose a trial in which we would assess patients going into treatment and assign their treatment based on whether the biomarkers indicated that they were very high risk for recurrence versus uh, a very low risk for recurrence as a way to potentially both uh, identify patients for intensification or de-intensification. Well, there are a number of reasons that uh, adjuvant trials or perioperative trials might have differences. The PROSPER trial has not been presented yet, so the data is not available to comment uh, specifically on PROSPER. But the designs of these trials are, of all of the trials, are very different from one another. For example, the EMOTION trial is evaluating a PDL1 inhibitor versus placebo in a similar population to Keynote 564, although they do not include metastatectomy population. The PROSPER trial enrolled patients that had uh, clinical stage T2 and higher, as well as a clear cell and a non-clear cell uh, population. And uh, the patients received treatment in advance of their resection versus, a, a, as well as uh, nine months of adjuvant treatment uh, to follow the uh, Rampart trial, which is being in, conducted in Europe, is looking at a PDL1 inhibitor in combination with a CTLA4 inhibitor in uh, similar populations of clear and non cell, non clear cell. And the Checkmate trials are is a randomized trial of adjuvant PD1 inhibitor versus PD1 CTLA4 and it's for a shorter period of time. So duration, drug type, patient population may all lead to differences in what we see as the results of these trials. So as I said before, I think that uh, using artificial intelligence to have you know computer uh, Computers looking at things that the human eye might not see would be another thing that could be looking at histology to perhaps see a signal. And then some of the other uh, results, both with liquid using uh, methylated DNA or using KIM-1 as an injury marker or uh, circulating tumor DNA. These are all things that are being looked at retrospectively in these trials. And if they were to show a signal, could be uh, proposed prospectively to both de-intensify or intensify therapy in these populations. So I wouldn't change the current uh, uh, NCCN guideline recommendations. I think for a very low risk population, you can do, do CAT scan or MRI imaging every six months for the first year and then yearly. For high risk populations, I would still recommend imaging of both the, the lungs as well as the abdomen on an every six month basis using either uh, CAT scan or MRI imaging for every six months for the first three years and then uh, yearly for at least five years. The younger populations are a little bit of a challenge because those patients can live a lot longer. And for that patient population, I think we should continue some imaging uh, on a yearly or an every other year basis uh, out to 10 years but I know that not everybody agrees with me with those recommendations. So some of the populations that were not uh, enrolled are patients who have clear cell carcinoma that have positive margins, for example, 
and uh, patients who are node positive, uh, they were enrolled in the trial, but patients who had positive margins were excluded from this trial. And I think in the real world, there are a lot of patients that we know have a little bit of residual tumor cancer left over. And it would be, those are the patients that I think are highest risk for recurrence, although interestingly, not all of those patients will go on to relapse. Some of those you can follow and they'll do perfectly well. So for my patient population, what I do is I, I present the results of the known kidney cancer adjuvant trials with my patients. I tell them the data, data that's out there, including the data using VEGF inhibitors as well as the data with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. And it's really a shared patient physician conversation. Some patients have other reasons that receiving an immune checkpoint inhibitor might not be a good idea. For example, they might have severe arthritis, they might have an autoimmune disease, or they physically um, might live at a very far distance or have economic constraints that would make it very difficult for them to receive the therapy. And for those patients, they may opt that they don't want to receive adjuvant therapy. There are other patients that are extremely anxious and you know, definitely want to receive adjuvant therapy. One of the concerns of immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy is that even though the side effect profile was low, at uh, 20% for severe adverse events. If you get a side effect, the side effect can be permanent. For example, you can develop diabetes from these medications. And if you develop diabetes, you have diabetes for the rest of your life that you generally requires insulin support. If you have damage to your adrenal gland or your pituitary gland, you might need to be on low-dose steroids for the rest of your life. If you have myocarditis, which is a very rare side effect, you might die from the immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So we have to really, really, really study these populations and really understand who is who should definitely get immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy versus maybe somebody else we should watch unless they develop metastatic disease. And they really are important questions. And even though it's very exciting for patients and physicians to have an adjuvant trial, that uh, an adjuvant therapy that is approved and efficacious in kidney cancer, it's also very important to continue to study this space and to really understand who definitely needs this kind of therapy and, and who we might watch.